Melissa, uh, thanks for having me today. It's, um, oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks for having me today. Me today. Uh, it's a real honor to be invited to speak here. Um, but yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about actually a side project that I've worked on during my master's thesis um, on the taxonomic turnover of microbial species across salinity gradients. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure how many of you guys are ecologists, but uh, if you go out in nature, depending on what the environmental conditions are, you can find a lot of different types of communities of organisms. Um, and there are a lot of different factors that can drive where an organism will live or where it won't live. Uh, things like heat, um, perhaps the pH of water, uh, the, the temperature, uh, and Amongst all the, of these abiotic factors that can affect where things live and where they don't live, salinity is considered a major driving factor um, behind the assembly of these um, organismal communities. And so if you look in nature, um, for example, in water systems, you'll find very different things that live in the river or in the ocean. Um, it'll, they'll differ in um, the type of plants that live there and animals um, and also the type of microbes that live there. Uh, so our lab works predominantly with microbes and uh, in 2014 a master's student named Ferdis Noir did a sampling expedition down the mouth of the Fraser River as you can see on the map on the left there um, and she sampled water samples from the mouth of the Fraser River all the way out into the Strait of Georgia and basically this spanned a really nice salinity gradient and then she characterized all the different types of microbial taxa that were living in the salinity gradient um, and then she wanted to see how they differed across this gradient. So this plot is in an NFDS ordination and basically what it is is it shows you how different or similar communities are. And so each dot is a single community or a single water sample and the closer two dots are to get to each other, the more similar they are and the farther apart they are, the more different they are. And so you can see when she's colored it by salinity, um, there's this very, very lovely gradient that occurs where uh, freshwater communities are, are all quite similar and marine communities are quite similar and they're, the fresh and the marine communities are different from each other. So we see this really beautiful turnover that occurs in microbial communities along salinity gradients. Um, and we also know that as you go from fresh to marine water and also the other way, um, you get and you see an abundance of freshwater specialists that gradually decrease as you increase salinity um, and also as you increase in salinity you gradually get more and more marine water specialists. But what we don't know a lot about is how turnover occurs um, along this gradient. So does it occur all at once perhaps because there's some point that it becomes very difficult to osm osmoregulate yourself uh, or does it occur very gradually with each different species essentially having a different point at which it can't survive anymore. And so we wanted to ask this question, oh sorry, and so we wanted to know how turnover occurs for these communities because um, it's, it's important to understand how the tax how the taxonomy changes along salinity gradients um, and how that might potentially relate to function uh, and perhaps also if you were to compare communities, we, you want to know where to divide them up. So at what point along the salinity gradient do you characterize something as a freshwater specialist and when do you characterize it as a marine water specialist um, and, and yeah. So the main question we wanted to ask with the data that we had was um, whether turnover occurs suddenly at some kind of universal turning point or if it did gradually um, one tax at a time. And the way that we chose to address this was by writing a program called Quantification of Turnover Across Gradients, also QTAG. Um, and basically what it does is it objectively determines individual OTU turnover points using statistically justified classifications. Um, and I will explain to you exactly what I mean by that. So uh, an OTU, by the way, is an operational taxonomic unit. It's basically more or less a bacterial species. And if you plot its abundance from a variety of samples along a salinity gradient, um, you can see how its distribution changes. And so, for example, this one, it's very abundant in freshwater at salinity of about zero parts per thousand. 
And then as you go higher and higher in salinity, it becomes less and less abundant. Um, the y-axis being the relative abundance of that OTU in the community. And so intuitively, this is a freshwater taxa, right? But unfortunately, when you look at data from microbial data sets, there are hundreds to thousands of different OTUs in even a single, single sample with millions of cells per milliliter of water. Uh, and so it's really hard to um, manually and also subjectively characterize all of these different taxa as to what kind of specialists they are. So what QTAG does is it takes um, X and Y and it iterates through all combinations of X and Y along the salinity gradient. And what X and Y do is it splits the data up into three bins, um, A, B, and C. And with these bins, it calculates the mean of each bin of all the data points in that group. Um, and then it then calculates the error squared between the data and that three piecewise model. Um, so you can see here that it's calculating the error squared between each point and then the mean within that bin. Um, and as it iterates through all combinations of X and Y, it finds the best fit model. So the combination of X and Y that yields the means A, B, and C that best fit the shape of the data. And so in this sample, um, this is actually the best fit model it found. And you can see that it kind of mimics the shape of the data. It goes from high abundance to low abundance. Uh, and once it finds the best fit model, then it compares the means A, B, and C, as well as how significantly different they are from each other to determine what kind of specialist it, specialist it is. So if you take three random OTUs that I had in my data set, um, you can see on the top left, you would intuitively think it's a freshwater taxa because it's abundant in low salinity and not in high salinity. Um, and the difference between mean A and C is significant if you do a Welch's t-test. Uh, so this is a freshwater taxa. The one on the left would be considered a marine water taxa um, because it's abundant in group C, not in group A, and the difference is also significant, so that's marine. And then finally, the bottom middle one is a brackish water community specialist uh, because it's abundant somewhere in the middle. So it's abundant somewhere between um, the low and the high range. Uh, so group A and C are significantly lower than group B. So that's brackish. And so the beauty of this is it not it classifies each OTU objectively and in the same manner, but not only that, it allows the breadth of tolerance range for each OTU to be uh, different. So the freshwater breadth is much smaller than the marine breadth, but it doesn't have a problem classifying them. And also it allows you to identify brackish water specialists all along the entire gradient. So it doesn't matter where it peaks, it'll still identify it as a brackish water specialist. Okay, so then finally what it does once it has its classifications is it redraws this turnover point that we're trying to find um, by averaging a weighted average of X and Y. In the case of brackish, you don't weight them because there needs to be two boundaries anyway. Uh, but yeah, so you basically you draw a new boundary and this is the turnover point that we are trying to get from each OTU in a community. Um, and so if we go back to the original data that I showed you. This is the final uh, boundary that QTAG had drawn for it. And from this, we can infer basically a tolerance range. And so in the bottom bar, um, or the bar on the bottom, you can see there's a dark blue bar. And so this is the inferred tolerance range that goes from zero parts per thousand up until that red uh, line B. And then the light blue bar is basically just showing you um, when the last non-zero abundance is. Um, and we had set an arbitrary threshold, but it's supposed to show you kind of the breadth of how much noise there is. Okay, so um, we took QTAG, which did all those things, uh, and ran it on two data sets, one from the Fraser River and one from the Baltic Sea. Uh, and so these two rivers uh, have a very similar range in salinities from zero to about 30 or 35 parts per thousand. Uh, but they're different because the Fraser River flows, flows very, very quickly and the water that stays in the brackish area is very transient. It, um, whereas the Baltic Sea, the brackish water has a very, very long residence time. And so things that live in that brackish water live in a relatively stable environment. And so we thought it would be neat to compare these two systems to see what kind of trends were consistent and what trends were very different between them. Okay, so recall you have 100 or maybe 1,000 OTUs that QTAG has um, classified and drawn boundaries for, and you get these little bars on the bottom, the, the blue, purple, and red bars. If you take them and stack them up, you get a plot that looks like this, um, which is basically showing you the OTU turnover for every single OTU across the entire community um, 
across the entire gradient. Uh, so on the y-axis is basically an OTU rank, and it's just sorting what to use by what's aesthetically pleasing, which is the, the mean of its tolerance range. And then on the x-axis is salinity. And so you can see as you go along salinity, there are freshwater specialists that are abundant, and then they drop off, and then uh, marine water specialists that come into play and then last until the end of the gradient. So the two questions that we wanted to ask were, one, is there a universal turning point? Um, so is there some kind of point at which uh, osmoregulation switches? Um, for example, there's this hypothesis that there's this horohalinicum, which is um, defined as the point where it's difficult to osmotically switch back and forth and maintain yourself. Um, and it's thought to be between five and eight parts per thousand, so we thought maybe there would be some kind of boundary there. Or perhaps it exists at some other location. There's some other point at which taxa tend to turn over. Um, conversely, it's possible also that there is no universal turning point, that things turn over gradually along the entire gradient. Um, and in this case, you'd see something that looks like this, where the ends of all these bars are quite staggered and there's no, um, there's no vertical line that describes them well. And the second question we wanted to ask was how do brackish and how and where do brackish species exist? So we know that there are things that live in brackish water, but it's not quite clear what their tolerance ranges are and where along the salinity gradient they tend to peak. And so, for instance, it's possible that there is this community of brackish water specialists that just live in all brackish water, or perhaps they specialize in certain areas in low brackish water or in high brackish water. Um, and so we wanted to visualize this to see what it looked like. Okay, so those are our two questions. Is there a universal turning point and where do brackish water species exist? Uh, and lastly, we just wanted to compare them to see uh, what they look like next to each other, the two, the two uh, data sets, the Fraser and the Baltic. Okay, so these are my results. Uh, so you can see that um, on the y-axis again, every horizontal line is an OTU and the salinity goes from zero to 30 parts per thousand. Uh, I also generated a taxa summaries plot, which basically shows um, the relative amount of specialist type at each salinity. So on the x-axis, again, is salinity, and the y-axis is percent abundance. And the script does what you would think it would do, and it creates actually pretty beautiful curves. Um, you can see that the freshwater specialists that it classifies become less abundant as you go further and further into higher salinities and then marine water specialists become more abundant. And somewhere in the middle, there are um, a collection of brackish water specialists. So the first question that we had was, is there a universal turning point? And the answer seems to be no. Uh, if you look at these graphs, they're quite highly staggered, and there doesn't seem to be a certain point at which taxa are more likely to turn over. Um, there are certain, still certain trends. For example, freshwater taxa tend to turn over sooner than marine water taxa tend to appear. Um, but overall, there is very little um, uh, uniformity in where they turn over. So the second question was, where do brackish water specialists exist? And so to, do, to look at this, we wanted to zoom into the Baltic data set because they happen to have more brackish water specialists. Um, and so if you zoom into it, you see that there's this cool trend where there are two kind of groups. There's a low brackish group um, that spans from approximately five parts per thousand to 10 parts per thousand. And then there's a high brackish group that goes from about 10 to 20 or so parts per thousand. Um, and I thought that was really neat. I thought that, uh, I thought that their ranges would all be the same, but apparently they are quite different. And if you zoom out again and you draw lines that, um, that encompass the limits of those two groups, we observe this interesting trend that's qualitative, but nonetheless interesting. Um, their limits seem to line up with the limits of marine and freshwater specialists. So if you look at the low brackish group, which is the first group, um, the point at which they start to appear happens to be the point at which freshwater specialists tend to disappear very quickly. And then their high limit is also the high limit of freshwater specialists. Whereas with the high brackish group, the lower limit seems to be where a lot of other marine things uh, also turn over, and then their upper limit is where there's a lot of marine turnover again. And so what we think this is telling us is there's actually a lot of interaction between these organisms along a salinity gradient. Um, the 
for example, the high brackish specialists might actually be just marine taxa that are unable to compete at very high salinities because that is a better, uh, a better range for other OTUs. And then as certain extreme marine specialists uh, are unable to cope with the salinity, they become more abundant um, and their lower limit of tolerance is actually the same as many other marine species because they essentially are marine species, just um, more tolerant to marine species to brackish waters. And so if you yeah, so if you draw the lines, they tend to line up with the turnover points of fresh and marine water taxa. And if you do this with the Fraser River data, um, you get a similar result, although slightly less satisfying, partially because there are so few taxa in the Fraser River that are brackish. Um, and, and yeah, um, so we thought this was really cool. And what QTAG has done for us is essentially identify these different groups of brackish water specialists that we weren't able to see before. Um, because if you just look at species abundance plots, like most people do usually when they're looking at um, change in composition across salinity, you just get one giant blob of purple. And it's very unclear that it's actually two very separate types of um, brackish water specialists that are occurring along this area. Yeah, so the last thing we wanted to do was the trends are approximately the same for Fraser and Baltic, but we also wanted to see what kinds of OTUs were shared between them, whether this, the freshwater taxa identified in the Fraser data set were the same as the freshwater taxa identified in the Baltic data set. And so I just did a simple comparison of OTUs. Um, and we found that surprisingly few OTUs were shared between the two data sets. So in the Fraser data set, there were 2,667 fresh OTUs um, and 278 fresh OTUs in the Baltic Sea, but only 47 of them were shared between the two. And so this just goes to show that there are very different things that are living in the Fraser River and the Baltic River, despite the trends of turnover being similar between them. Um, and yeah, so in summary, we found no universal turning point in our data, um, but we did find two distinct brackish groups of OTUs, a low brackish specialist and a high brackish specialist. Um, and there seems to be some kind of interaction between where these specialist ranges are in relation to freshwater and marine water specialists. Um, and lastly, all of the trends are the same between data sets, the OTU representatives are different. And so there are different things living in the Fraser River and the Baltic Sea. Um, and with that, I just want to thank the my lab, the Posse Lab, uh, my supervisor, Cillian, and a plethora of techs and helpers that have helped me do this work. Thanks. <laughs> no, so actually I'm glad you brought that up and I forgot to say this, but so QTAG is written and designed so that it can be used across whatever gradient you want. Um, and so my hope is that once I publish this and, and make this script not ugly, um, we, people can actually plug in their own data and choose whatever gradient they want as long as they have the metadata for their samples. Um, and so I think it will be really cool to see uh, how turnover occurs all, across all sorts of gradients, including the ones that you mentioned. Any more questions? Let's thank Melissa again. Thanks.